Hello and welcome to the Art Class Curator podcast. I am Cindy Ingram, your host and the founder of Art Class Curator and the Curated Connections Library. We're here to talk about teaching art with purpose and inspiration, from the daily delights of creativity to the messy mishaps that come with being a teacher. Whether you're driving home from school or cleaning up your classroom for the 15th time today, take a second, take a deep breath, relax those shoulders, and let's get started. Hi, everybody. It's Cindy Ingram from Art Class Curator. Welcome back to the podcast. And today for you, I have a session that I recorded for Call to Art. So Call to Art was our conference that we created in the wake of the pandemic. We did Call to Art 1 in March 2020. We did Call to Art 2 in November of 2020. It was an amazing experience bringing together a lot of educators from across the country. I think over between the two of them, we had over 80 or 90 presenters, tons of amazing presentations. So the presentation that I am going to be sharing with you today on the podcast is called Rediscovering the Emotional power of art. So in the video, I actually do show some artwork. So you'll hear me talk about the artwork and talk, maybe I'll mention something on the screen. So just you're able to get the content without the images. But if you would like to access this recording, as well as the other 90 plus presenters, you can still purchase the recordings for Call to Art. If you head over to artclasscurator.com slash CTA, you can still get access to those amazing, amazing sessions. So check that out. And without further ado, here is my presentation from the Call to Art 2 called Rediscovering the Emotional Power of Art. Hello, everybody. This is Cindy Ingram from Art Class Curator. And as you probably know, I am obsessed with creating connections between works of art with people, between your students and the art, you and the art, between you and your students and the art. Um, All of that is, is so incredibly important to me. That is why I created Art Class Curator, so that we could expand that those connections across the world. So today, what I want to do is tell you a little bit about why you should show more works of art to your your students, Mm -hmm. and also why some of the connections that can happen, what we learn from looking at art, and how we learn from looking at art. And I'm going to do that through some like real world examples um, of myself as an example. And hopefully you can see the importance of showing art to your students. And then we are also going to cover some ways to increase these sorts of personal connections with works of art in our classroom. And I'm excited to share that with you. So the title of my presentation is Rediscovering the Emotional Power of Art. And I think that we can get lost when we're teaching to focus on the making, the teaching of the elements and principles, the teaching of the skills, the teaching of the techniques. All of that is super important. All of those things we have to do but that there is a deeper emotional power to art. There is a personal connection, especially with looking at works of art. And there's things that we can learn about ourselves, about other people through looking at and experiencing art that is so wonderfully amazing. So I have always felt a a deep connection to art. I loved art class. I wanted to be a Disney animator when I grew up. I was obsessed with Disney movies, especially The Lion King, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. But it wasn't until I was a junior in high school where I actually saw art for the first time, like real art. I only have a memory of one artist that I learned about in art class, and that was Matisse. We actually did the same project twice because I had the same art teacher in middle school and high school. She like she got a new job at the high school and did the exact same lesson plan. So anyway, I did the same project twice, learning about Matisse. But that was really the only artist that I had been really introduced to. And there was, uh, in, in high school, we had a teacher who took students to Europe every summer. It was a month long. You got college credit for it. He was really into art history. So we visited all the museums. We learned about them before we went. We did you know, all sorts of things. And then when I got to Europe that summer, I saw art for the first time and I was completely blown away because it really was 
at that time that I realized it wasn't really the art that I want. It wasn't art that I wanted to make. It was art that I wanted to experience. It was those feelings of connecting with something that someone else made. That really is where my, that's where my heart was. It wasn't in the creation of the art. So when I was there, I got to see these museums and I would see the tour guides. I would see the, um, I keep saying guardians. It's not the right word security guards uh, were there. And I was just like, they get to be here every day. Their job is to stand by that art or their job is to teach about that art to the kids that come here. And I was so amazed by that. I got home and the same teacher who teaches the, who led the Europe trip did a humanities class for seniors. That was like an AP art history class. And that's where I really learned about all the art. And I was just totally enamored with art history at that moment. So when I went to college, I got my degree in art history. And then I um, started with the goal of working in art museums. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a museum educator because I always knew I was good at teaching and I found this love of art. And so I thought this would be a perfect combination. So I am working in museums and then ended up Oh, I have the slide of my all of my art history degree memes because you know, <laughs> we're the, our, uh, you art history majors know that you guys, we're the laughing stock of the internet. Everyone's like, oh, your art history degree is worthless. You, you're a barista, you know, all of that kind of stuff. So I got my art history degree, started working in museums, and then I was in the process of applying to get my PhD in art history because that's what you do next, right? You you get the degree in art history, you get the PhD. I was skipping my master's somehow. I think I was applying to programs where you could just go like get your master's PhD at the same time. So anyway, I was applying for that until I came across the artwork that really moved me for the first time. I was, this was in 2004 and all of the MoMA artworks were on, taken down because the MoMA was doing renovations. And so they sent all of the artwork from MoMA to Houston, the Museum of Fine Arts Houston. And they had the Surrey Night. They had, you know, the all the Kandinsky's and the Delhi's Persistence of Memory. All of that stuff was just a few hours from me because I was in Dallas. So we drove down. It was New Year's Day. We drove down in the morning, went to the exhibit, drove back at night because we were super broke, me and my husband. We were super broke. We couldn't afford a hotel room. So, we, you know, we just did it in one day just to go to this exhibit. And when I get there, you know, it's really exciting. I got to see the, the Van Goghs and all this stuff. And then I go in and I turn the corner and I remember it so well, like exactly what this gallery looked like. There was a doorway. I turned in and to the right of me, I saw Picasso's girl before me, or I'm pointing at my screen because that's the one I'm talking about. <laughs> um, I saw Picasso's girl before me, and it was like a punch in the stomach. Like all of the wind just left my body and it was just like this big heave, you know, like I saw it and just, it overtook me. And I, it's not like I had this deep love for this painting. I probably was peripherally aware that it existed, but it wasn't like this one that I was really excited about looking at. You know, I, I like Picasso. I saw a Picasso exhibit at the Kimball Art Museum a few years before and I kind of, you know, liked it, liked his work, whatever, you know, knew about it, but it wasn't like this was like the star. I was really excited to see it. So I, I um, turned the corner, totally got the wind knocked out of me. I went to this painting and I could not leave it. Like I couldn't step away from this painting. I cried. I stared. I analyzed every single inch of this painting. I didn't, I was kind of scared of it, but I was just in awe of it. And I was feeling all of the feelings that one person could possibly feel. I was just feeling them all. My husband was with me. He went through the entire rest of the exhibit, came back through. I was still in front of this one painting. I couldn't leave it. They just couldn't. And no one else was like really looking at it either. They probably were wondering what the heck I was doing. Because, you know, it was a lot of the people with the audio guides. And thankfully, this one wasn't on the audio guide. So they weren't interested in it. You know how that goes. So when I'm looking at this artwork, I even left. When I left on the way home, I wrote like a four-page essay. I still have it somewhere about my experience in front of this work of art. So not only did I have a lot of personal connections to it, um, I'll talk about those a little bit later, but what I ultimately left that experience with was that I realized that art was magic. 
that looking at art gave me the ability to feel my feelings in a way that I didn't really understand. Cause I've never, I've, I've always been a very emotional person, but I don't have a lot of emotional, I didn't have a lot of emotional awareness or fluency to really know. And so I was kind of scared of my emotions and, and, you know, growing up, it was one of those things, like it's one of those lives where you kind of, we're supposed to stuff down your emotions and you're not supposed to talk about your emotions, feel your emotions, emotions are inconvenient to the people. So emotions were, or, or have had a lot of years coming to terms with how to deal with emotions. But at the time I'm feeling everything. And then I also realized that what would happen if I get my PhD in art history, which is what I was doing, what I was applying to do, would I lose that emotional impact that art had? If I would spend a year studying this, writing, say I chose to write a thesis or dissertation on Picasso's Girl Before a Mirror, like, would it still have the magic? Would it still have the emotional impact? If I knew too much, would I lose that feeling that I get when I look at a work of art? You know, would I lose that experiential moment of gasp, you know? So I left that and I completely scrapped my PhD plans in art history and decided to do art education instead, because I want everyone else to have that experience too. I want everyone else to experience that magic that art has. And yeah, completely changed course um, because of this one experience. So I leave, I go about my life, I get my master's in art education rather than art history. And then eventually, landed in the classroom. So I was years in museums, started teaching college first, and then I started teaching um, elementary. And then I ended up teaching other things. You know, I taught middle and I taught online. I did all sorts of other teaching, but this is, this is my slide of faces of a photo shoot I did. I think it adequately represents teaching, right? Like the amount of emotions you feel in like five minutes is as a teacher, like it's all, is in all of this. So I started to teach and I had this deep love of art. I wanted to get that to my students. I wanted to teach art history in a way that wasn't boring, that wasn't lecture, that wasn't just memorizing dates. I wanted my students to understand the capacity or greatness and magic and love and emotional impact that you can feel with a work of art, how a work of art can completely change the whole course of your life. I wanted my students to feel that. So I would take to the internet creative ways to teach the Renaissance or activities to do in front of a work of art or whatever it was. Every time I would Google something, nothing came up. It was just constantly me Googling, nothing to find, creating it myself, me Googling, nothing to find, creating it myself until finally I realized, Hey, you know what I can do is I can create the thing that I want myself. I can make it. (laughs) So that's when I started Art Class Curator in 2014. I just started writing blog posts about all the things that I wanted to know about. I knew in my art history education and in all of that, that I really was too Western focused. So I started to research and learn about artworks from around the world, started to put that up on the blog, started to take all these lessons I developed as a museum educator, as as a teacher, started to put those up on the blog. And then I eventually created the Curated Connections Library, which I put all of that stuff in. And then the Spark Hybrid Learning Curriculum, which we created for this lovely pandemic situation that we're in right now. And then also Sparked Art, which is a homeschool course. So I took all of these things that I had developed myself to create that emotional power. And I put it into Art Class Curator. So that's kind of a little bit how I began. But what I want you to think about um, as you're listening to this is what role in 20 years, what role do you want art to play in your students' lives? Think about that question for a minute. Think about what your answer is. Settle in on that. And I want you to realize that most every single time I've asked this question of groups of teachers, and I've asked this question of groups of teachers countless times, nobody ever says, I want them to understand a zigzag line. (laughs) You know, I want them to understand how to shade a a sphere perfectly and make it look like it's a shadow. Like those are some things that are fun to teach and learn. And then you can, they're, you know, they're necessary in some degree. But that's not the end goal of your art curriculum. 
you don't, what, what the answers I get to this are wide ranging. You want them to embrace their creativity. You want them to have self-expression. You want them to understand they have an outlet. You want them to understand they're not alone in the world and that art can be a piece and value in their life. There's so many other things that we want for our students and none of it, anytime I've ever asked this is I want them to be an artist often. Actually, that's not even really ever brought up. We do want, yeah, yeah, yes, if they become an artist, that is awesome. That's so cool. And it can be like of an artist, artist, like that's their profession, or it can be they make art on the side. You know, we want that to be a part of their lives. But really, in the end, art as a connection, art as a refuge, art as an expression, art as a piece of your life that has value, that is something we want all of our students to have as they live their lives. We know that art makes better people. We know that art will create more joyful people, more connected people, more empathetic people. So that's what we're looking for in the art, in our art education. So as you're creating lessons and as you're thinking about this, really think like, is this going to reach the end goal? We want to create memorable connected experiences. So anyway, (laughs) I could go on a rant. So, but ultimately what I realized in that moment with Picasso's Girl Before a Mirror is that art is magic, that art is what, art has the ability to transcend and pierce into the soul of a person, right? So when we look at a work of art made by someone else, there is a lot that we're learning. It's more than just making something. It is understanding life and the human spirit. It is feeling emotions, expressing emotions, understanding emotions that other people have. And then it is connecting to the past. It is connecting to other cultures. It is learning to look closely, to be more aware, to be more observant. It's helping our students solve problems and think critically. And it's helping them know themselves better. Because every time I look at a work of art and I have a powerful experience with it, There's something about me that I learn. And that is, I think, the ultimate goal of being a person is to grow into who you are and be who you are and find yourself through your life. And that's what we're all striving for. And art gives us a place to do that and to understand that. Art gives us focus, awareness, observation. I think so many of us are used to like flashes and images. We quickly look, we move away, but when we slow down and we look at art and we learn from art, it allows us to really focus our observation skills. Think about our world that we live in now, Instagram, TikTok, you know, all the things that's like constant images going through our lives nonstop all day long. Slowing down and looking at art, our students learn how to really Understand how images are manipulating them. Understanding how images are used to accomplish a goal. And this is something we really can um, teach our students to be aware of. Art also gives us higher level thinking skills. And it allows us to have conversations about hard topics that we aren't necessarily comfortable speaking about in, you know, just outright. But using art as a tool to have those hard conversations makes it a little bit easier for us to embrace that as teachers and as people in general. Like for example, on this slide here, we have Caravaggio's Judith beheading Holfernes and also Gentileschi's Judith slaying Holfernes. And I asked my students, which one was done by a man? Which one was done by a woman and why? And then we have this discussion and then we end up having a vote and it's usually always 50, 50, 50% are right, 50% are wrong. So you know, the, then they, but then they can have a discussion about gender bias. You know, why would a woman, why is more, a man more likely to depict a woman as more dainty, whereas a woman is showing a woman more strong? Like, what are all of these things that we're thinking of and we're making assumptions and all of this is happening and swirling around in our head and we're not, we're not really aware of it. And so having this conversation allows us to really think through that, you know, and, and process that in, in, in more powerful ways. Looking at art creates empathy and helping you see through the lens of another person, you know, you can't really fully see the perspective of another person. Your lens, like what Brene Brown says, is like your, your perspective, your lenses are like 
they're plastered onto your face. There's no way you can take yours off and put somebody else's on. But art allows us to glimpse into the life of another person and see how they're living, see how they're feeling, see how they process the world, what they're thinking. And it's, you know, art says what, what can't be said. And, and you feel that when you're looking at it. So when we look at art, we're learning empathy, connection, respect. When you see artwork done by someone else across the world, you're feeling their feelings, seeing how they feel. And you see, ultimately, they're just people like you are. And that, I think, is really powerful for our students. And some of them live in such bubbles. They don't leave their houses, their where they're at in their communities to see that there are people outside that are just like them, living lives just like them, feeling feelings just like them. Another thing that's really powerful about work of art is embracing uncertainty. When you think about right now in our history, we always have the answer to every question. <laughs> I, I can just pop, I can just take this phone and I can I can get the answer to anything. Except for right now, I'm living in uncertainty because I'm in the middle of recording this during the presidential election and the votes have been cast, but they haven't been counted. So we're, you know, there's uncertainty there. And but the but same thing is everyone's drastically um like just no one could stand living in this uncertainty right now. But you know, looking at a work of art and interpreting it and not know like we never know, like we have our own answer. And when we look at an artwork, our interpretation of that artwork is just as valid as whatever the artist said or the art historian or the person at the museum or the, the label, the, the art teacher, the, the other student who's also looking at it. Everybody's interpretation is just as valid and just as right because once the artwork leaves the artist's hands, it becomes their own. And so we can't just Google it, you know, like because the answer is inside of us. And I think in so many situations in life that the answer is inside of us. It's always inside of us that there isn't an answer that we just go to. And I think people right now, like I see it all the time in, on Facebook where someone's like, oh, I can't decide what to do. What do I do? And so they'll post it on Facebook and they'll, they'll get all the answers. And so like they just need to someone to give them the answer. And I think experiencing works of art, we can help our students understand that they've got the answers inside them. They don't need to go looking for them. Also on this slide is curiosity and wonder. When we look at things that are interesting and new and different, like it just creates a sense of curiosity for the world and what it has to offer us. And then my favorite one <laughs> is understanding self. When you look at an artwork, you learn, like I already said, you learn bits of you that you didn't know. And it helps you reflect on your life in different ways. I'm going to show you some examples of that here in a little bit. So all of this to say that, you know, students learn so much from looking at art. But right now, more than ever, because I'm filming this, you know, during the pandemic, right now, we really need to support our students and their social emotional skills, social emotional learning, that understanding emotion, understanding what emotion is, uh, articulating what emotions you're feeling, being able to recognize it, all of that are so such important skills in our life. And that we, when we connect with works of art, we can start to do that. We can start to name feelings. We can look at something that someone is experiencing a work of art and we can start putting names to those feelings. And we can say, well, when was the time when you felt that way? And make that connection to the artwork yourself. Because, you know, I'm a big Brene Brown fan and she has some research that she's doing. And I think that I think there's going to be a book about it, but it hasn't come out yet. <laughs> she's, she's talked about it. It's like, this is research is ongoing. So I can't wait till that book comes out. But she said, and I was listening to Dare to Lead. That was the most recent one I was reading. And she said that there was research that they did and that most people can only recognize three art emotions, anger, sadness, and joy or happiness. And that, that was like the average person's emotional fluency, though those, those three. But really to be like an emotionally literate person to, to really exist in this world effectively, you need to be able to recognize 30 different emotions. And this just this just blows my mind because 
Yeah, three and 30, right? So I, it makes me really um, empowered to think of how we can experience these emotions, how we can talk about them with our students. And ultimately, you know, I don't, I don't know about you, but my personal experience when I was a child, I was a very high achieving child. Like I was a straight A student. I always wanted to do the very best. Like if I got like a 93, I would be very disappointed in myself, you know? And then I also, I told you earlier that I was in sort of a situation where emotions are, we don't talk about them. You know, those are not things we talk about. We stuff them in. And so it took me 10, 15 years out of high school to start to untangle the effect of that, of not recognizing my emotions, stuffing all my emotions down, overachieving where I didn't need to overachieve and really come to terms with who I am, how I feel, what I am as part like who, what, what, what is my purpose, you know? And I would have loved someone to tell me you're feeling embarrassed. You're feeling overwhelmed. You're feeling, you know, this is what you're, or, you know, teaching me that and to teach me that it's okay to feel that, you know, I think I would have been, it would have saved me some emotional turmoil over those 15 years. So anyway, we created recently a feelings wheel, which um, we originally, I think the original one, we, we found all sorts of versions of the feeling. Well, the original one looks like came from Dr. Gloria Wilcox. We took the idea and created a new one for use with works of art. So you can take this feelings wheel, you can, look, you show it to your students, help them identify emotions in artwork. You can use it to help them identify emotions in themselves. So if you want this download, um, I meant to put the link in here, but if you, I'll just do artclasscurator.com slash feelings, you'll find that feeling wheel there so that you can download it and use it in your classroom. So social emotional skills, super, super important right now. So, you know, I say all of this, what art teaches you, the empathy, the connection, the respect, all of those things, it's very abstract. I can say that. And you go like, oh yeah, okay, I get it. Sure. You know, all of those things help. But I'm, now I'm going to show you some like actual examples of things that I learned in front of works of art. Because a few years ago, I was teaching, uh, and we were teaching, it, it was a lesson on German expressionism. But that was the overall topic for the day. And in, my, in the first activity for the lesson we were looking at Franz Marx's fate of the animals I was leading a discussion about it we were talking about the you know the typical visual thinking strategies asking questions sharing thoughts talking about the lines and the colors all those things, sorts of things and then one of my students this was an online teaching I used to teach online for a period of time and so she put in the chat she said what are we learning here how does this relate to art and she just see me I was like Oh, uh, well, this is art. That is a work of art. You were in art class. We were looking at it and we were talking about it. So that's it. But, you know, ultimately it's like the students don't necessarily know this is happening. And I, and I started to think about that too, was like without concrete examples that you too might really not see the power that artwork can have on a person. So I'm going to share with you some of my examples of artworks that have had powerful um, connections with me personally. And then we're going to talk about then what do we do with that? How do we create the environment in our classrooms to create that experience for our students so that when they're my age or when they're 24 or when they're, you know, whatever age they're at, that they're primed to have these experiences and they've really, you've built the groundwork for them to have art be that power in their lives. Okay. So before I tell you some of my stories, I want you to really think about what your art story is. I always ask at the end of the podcast, I say, what artwork changed your life? And I love the answers to this question because they, they are so wide ranging. And I've been doing a lot of research doing some interviews of different people, asking them this question, having them share with me uh, a powerful art experience. And then I have been taking notes and I have been, you know, making some conclusions. And so I'm doing a lot more of that. This is really early in the process. So I can't wait to share with you. Like down the line, there will be some more things that come out relating to that research that I'm doing. But uh, what I want you to do is think about your art story. Think about 
how it felt in your body when you saw the artwork for the first time. What thoughts did you have? Or what feelings did you have? So you had the physical sensations, you had the emotions, you had the thoughts. If all of that, you know, all of those things are tied together. Thoughts reflect your feelings, feelings reflect your thoughts, your body responds to all of it. You know, that's all embedded together. But think about what that is. And then how did it impact you after it was over? So what did you think about? And then, you know, a week later, a year later, five years later, what impact did that art experience have on your life? So I want you to really think about that. If you were here with me, I'd have you close your eyes. We'd all close our eyes and think about it together. So if you want to stop and pause, maybe journal on this, maybe you can reach out to me and schedule an interview with me and then tell me about it because I would love to hear about your powerful art experience because that's my jam. So please do that if you... Um, if you have a, a story to tell, I would love to hear it. So think about that art story. And I have had many of these art experiences. And honestly, you never know what it's going to be. So I have gone into museums and I always go, I'm like, I'm open to having an, a really amazing experience today. I don't know what it's going to be. You might think, oh, I'm gonna really going to see this one work of art. That's really why I'm here. And then it's the one next to it that grabs me and like knocks me over. You know, you never know what it's going to be. And so I kind of have a little caveat that my own, so I'm going to share you some personal art experiences that I've had. And often my art experience is not the real interpretation of the artwork. So an example here, we have Henry Corners, my parents too. I saw this in, I think it was in Minneapolis at the um, Minneapolis Institute of Art. I saw it and it was beautiful. The colors immediately grabbed me, you know, the golden of it. Um, It it made me think of my own grandparents. It made me think that, you know, all my grandparents had passed by this point. I saw the two paths, made me think of Robert Frost's poem of the two roads that diverged in a yellow wood, yellow woods, a yellow painting, you know, and I took the one less traveled. Like I used to, when I was a child, like I was obsessed with poetry. I love, I love all things, art, right? Music, dance, theater, all of it. But I love that poem. And I had that poem memorized. I don't know why. No one, no one asked me to, I just did it, you know? but I, I don't have it memorized anymore. But I, well, I took the road less traveled and that has made all the difference. I, I mean, that's probably all I know from this point. But anyway, I saw that, I saw that poem in there because it was, that's a poem for my, my past. And then when you look at an artwork, depending on what you, where you are in your life, you're going to experience a different thing, depending on what's going on in your life. I have an example of that in a minute, but okay. So all that said, that was my connection with this artwork. The label had no information. It said Henry corner, my parents too, 1926. Like that's all I said. So I go home and I decide out. I like to just share art experiences on the Art Class Curator website and on you know social media or in an email. So I, I remember at the time I would do like uh, artwork of the week features and I would just share an artwork and write about it. So I wrote about this one. I looked it up, did some research. I learned the real interpretation, right? What it's actually about. And then I shared my own interpretation that I, the feelings I had when I looked at it. Well, sure enough, you know, people on the internet, they love to do this. They, someone emailed me back and was just like, how dare you talk about that other stuff about this artwork when it really was about this. And what it is about is Henry Corner lost his parents in the Holocaust. They were separated and they both died in concentration camp. But that whole interpretation that whole meaning that that artist had is not mine. I didn't have my parents die in the Holocaust when I saw this painting. I experienced a love for my grandparents. It just connected me with them. It made me think of them. And it made me think of that poem. Um, I'm not saying that's, that's the right reason. You know, I'm not saying that's the right interpretation, but that was the one I had. And that was the connection I had. And so my interpretation is just as right as anybody else's. So just remember that, that you don't know what the connection is going to be. You don't know that's what you're going to feel when you see the artwork. You don't know what's going to make you feel. It could be just that particular color of gold remind you of something random like that you just you just weren't expecting. So you have to open yourself up to that. And then you have to not be judgmental about that. Like you can't judge me for having an interpretation of this painting because that's what art is. <laughs> it's, it's interpretation. That's what life is, is interpretation. That's a whole other thing. 
Same thing with Van Gogh I have on this slide. You know, a lot of people have a lot of fond emotions towards this painting. They, you know, they have a lot of connection to it. It reminds them of, it's one of the only paintings, it's like the painting they really love, brings them a lot of joy. But then we know that Van Gogh was feeling really anxious when he made it. He was in a mental hospital when he created this. And this was his view through the window, right? So we really have to keep that in check that there is, there's no sort of pretentious right here. There's no, I know more about art than you because I read about this one. I read the label. I listened to whatever it is about that artwork. That the connection is between me or you or your student or whoever's looking at that artwork and the artwork. That is the relationship. So there's no way that that relationship can be wrong. So keep that in mind. And so if, if I say something that you're like, well, that's not what it's about, check yourself because that's not what, that's not what art's about. And I think that is so important that we, we transmit that to our students that they realize they have the ability, they have everything they need to experience the art in whatever way they want to experience it. You know, you're going to help them to develop the tools to look at it more deeply. You're going to teach them how to look for the line and the color and how that impacts the meaning. You're going to teach them about symbolism and how to look for symbolism and all that. But ultimately, in the end, their experience is their experience no matter what. My experience is my experience no matter what. You can't change that. Okay. I feel like I'm going to a lot of soapboxes here. Uh, <laughs> but here we go. So I'm going to share with you just a few of the artworks that um, have had a really strong emotional connection with me. So the first, I say the first powerful art experience was Picasso's Curl Before a Mirror, but that's really the first like art work, you know, like I'm at a museum, there's painting experience. Um, but really the first aesthetic experience I had was with Lion King. And I was in the eighth grade when Lion King came out and I lived in Amarillo, Texas. And at the time there was a dollar theater right around the corner from my house. I don't think it's there anymore. Um, actually I've been back to Amarillo in many years, but anyway, um, so I would walk to the dollar theater like every weekend all the time and go, we would see whatever was there, but Lion King, I saw 12 times at the theater because I was obsessed with Lion King. I knew all the animators and which characters they did and all the different Disney movies and Aladdin and all of the ones that came before Lion King. But every time I saw Lion King, I would cry when the giraffes would bow in Circle of Life <laughs> every time. And I still kind of gets me. Um, and then I look back and, you know, at the time I thought it was, it was just because I loved animation and I loved Disney and I love, you know, I wanted to be an animator. I wanted to write the music too. I, you know, I'm just like, oh, I'll animate and I'll write the score. You know, that's the overachiever I was. But anyway, I would have this emotional reaction every time. And I realize it now looking back, I was having an art experience. I was connecting emotionally with, some, with what someone else made. And then I was seeing that giraffe bow and it was so awkward and wonderful. And I just felt so awkward at you know, eighth grade. I was just, I was a mess. I was just a mess of a person <laughs> in middle school and seeing, you know, I just felt part of something and I was, I could see that in the art. And so I learned that I was part of something when I was watching The Lion King. And then of course, I already told you about this one and how it changed the trajectory of my career. But this one also had a very strong impact on me personally, because like that giraffe that was awkwardly bowing, I have always felt other, like, like different, you know, <laughs> I'd not, not so much anymore, but like, there was this feeling that I was an outsider and really, you know, I, that's another Brene Brown thing is that belonging is a really core thing that humans need to feel to feel safe. And I never necessarily, I just always felt like I didn't belong. And so I also felt that I was trying to control everything in my life and trying to feel put together and trying to be ambitious and trying to show and prove and all this stuff. But that the inside of myself was just this, swirling emotional dramatic <laughs> thing you know and so I would look at I, one of the things I thought about when I looked at this painting is that when I looked in the mirror that's like who I felt like I was on the inside isn't who I am trying to portray on the outside and that there isn't two people there is the 
the facade, there is who I'm portraying myself to be. And then there's who I actually am. And I felt when I looked at this, that that was, there was, that's this sort of battle that I was experiencing. So that was in 2004. And I went back and got to see this painting again for the second time, 10 years later in 2014. And I had a very similar experience. I was very excited to see it again because I hadn't had, it was the first time I ever traveled to New York. I was really excited to be there. And I saw the painting again and I had more emotions about it. And this is actually me tortured to take a picture next to it. I felt like I had to, but I had a very, another similar experience. I had done a lot of self-development. I had come so far in understanding who I was. I felt like more whole inside of myself than I ever had. I felt like I had, uh, there was that year's the year I started our class curator is two months after I started this website, but I'm looking at this painting again and it's a similar experience of who I am on the inside. It's not who I am on the outside. I'm going to start crying. And so that looking in the mirror and seeing something, not what, not what you're kind of expecting to see, not what you feel inside. I was, I felt that way about this artwork again. So it's just that experience of every time you see something, it changes. And that was actually that, that time was a very pivotal moment in my life. You can see I look a little bit different than I did back then. I, you know, like I said, I started this business, lost a bunch of weight uh, and and I'm slowly kind of (laughs) getting to the point where, you know, who I am on the inside and who I am on the outside, like, Ultimately, it doesn't matter, but I feel more whole, I guess, than I ever did. Anyway, so that that artwork really allowed me to look into who I am and see myself and learn about myself in different ways. Another artwork, this was actually the last artwork, last one of the last world last museum visit I made before the pandemic started. And I it's November and I haven't been in a museum since, and this was February. Isn't that devastating? Uh, but anyway, this one I looked at and she was larger than life. This, I don't know. I, sh- I wish I knew the measurements, but she was probably a good four feet taller than I am. She was huge. And she, she's awesome. Like she's such a badass. She's like strong and she's magical and she's powerful and she's like fierce, but she's like hunched over and looking down. And so I'm looking at that. I'm like, stand up, like, show your power, show who you are. And I, and then I was like, Oh, wait a minute. What am I, what is this telling me about me? Where am I not showing my power? So I'm looking at this and it helps me like what see something in me. And that this was actually at the end of a weekend of that was kind of emotionally vulnerable. I was spending, spending some time with some of my business mastermind group. And like, there was a lot of vulnerability and different things. I was feeling really raw when I saw this. And so I could really like feel into this experience with this artwork. So it kind of taught me a little bit about me. So I have a lot of examples. I'm going to kind of quick through some of them. Like, Oh wait, this is this last one. Like I realized this, this artwork gave me a lot of anxiety and I was, it made me realize like I like things to be orderly and in control. And it was like really hard for me to look at this. Um, And this one I learned like life and art can be fun. It doesn't have to be like so serious. And so like, you know, that you can just go and, and have a good time. I laughed my head off this entire exhibit, Nina Ketchadorian, so funny. But the last one I'm really going to share with you, I could, I could talk about art experiences all day. So that's why I say, email me, tell me about yours, because I, I love to talk about art experiences. But one of my great loves is Hamilton. You can see I have a Hamilton playbill over there signed. I've seen Hamilton three times live. And every time I've seen it, where I was in my life made me feel differently about Hamilton. And and I responded to different parts of the story each time I saw it. So the first time I saw it, it was in um, fall of 20, and it doesn't matter, you don't care. But it was (laughs) was at a moment, uh, 2016, 2017, I don't remember. It was a moment of my life. I was working full time as a teacher. And I was running the website full time. So it was enough work now. The, the, the website took full time work, creating the content, the emails, you know, all the, all the things. And I was teaching. 
And I was feeling like I had been putting my heart and soul into my website, but I wasn't really seeing any success from it. I'm still working two jobs. I'm still really stressed out. And so I really emotionally responded to Aaron Burr's character. Every time he sang, I would just weep, (laughs) weep every time he sang. And you could see his emotions grow through it and, you know, like wait for it. And all this stuff, like he was just patient and waiting and waiting for his time. And I'm looking back, I don't think I realized it at the time. That's probably what I was responding to because that's really how I was feeling in my life at the time is I was feeling like, when is it going to be my turn? You know, when is this going to work? Because it wasn't really working just yet. So, but then, okay, I saw it again later. And it was in, uh, I saw, so the first time I saw it in Chicago, and then I saw it in Houston. And it was one within a week of a school shooting that had happened outside of Houston. It was in a small town outside of Galveston, which is right, you know, right there. It had just happened. And I am watching the scene of Hamilton, spoiler alert, uh, if you haven't watched it, you, it's history. So hopefully you just, it's not going to impact you too much. You can pause it if you don't want to hear this. Uh, anyway, it was the time when Hamilton's son was was shot in the duel. And, you know, there's this scene and the, and the spinning around and um, Philip is dying on the table and Philip is Sue, or not Philip is Sue, it was um, Eliza is like over him and they're like crying and like they're singing. <laughs> and, and I realized at that same time that, Less than an hour from where I was physically, mothers were crying over their children who had died by gunfire. And like, <laughs> I'm, this is the second time I'm tearing up in this presentation. But I don't allow myself to follow the news too carefully. I don't watch a lot of news or listen to a lot of news or I just kind of read the headlines. I get the basic information of what's going on in the world, but I don't like, I, I kind of have to emotionally protect myself from that. So I hadn't really allowed myself to really feel the pain of all the school shootings. And at that moment, art gave me that vehicle as a way to feel what I was feeling about it. And I kept crying full on until like 30 minutes after it was over. I couldn't stop. Um, but it gave me that sort of, place and they gave me that sort of outlet you know and it felt safe to feel that and felt more in control to feel it but I still got to feel it you know and then the third time I saw it it was a really more more happy time in my life and it was like really joyful and like all the Skylar sister songs I like loved this that was like the what brought me the most joy was when you know the lucky to be alive song like you know all of those songs so really you know art changes and we change And so it always is evolving. And so you could see something one day, it doesn't strike you at all. You could see something a week later or a year later, equal a week later too. And then it could be completely different for you. Um, And so that's, what's so powerful about art. Now I can go on. I've got more, but I'm not going to do it Um, because, Oh, but this one, this is another one. There was, I saw it. And then at the same time, there was uh, like, as in Syria, there was a bunch of refugees. There was a bombing in, um, Aleppo and like there was on social media there was all these like videos of people fleeing and like people holding their children and crying and wailing and like they're covered in ash and that had just been going on in the news and then I saw Guernica and I just like that's all I could see I was like this is real life this is the pain of real life in art and that's really what Picasso was coming at is he was taking his pain from real life it's like the only like really political work of art he ever did um, everything was like mothers and children and, you know, still lies and stuff like that. And then he creates this as just like uh, a way to process and also like take a stand politically. But um, man, this one wrecked me. So anyway, I'm not going to share you all of the examples, but, you know, I hope you can see and I hope you're thinking through hearing these experiences that it is such a personal thing. And that I, what I'm trying to accomplish here (laughs) is that you, whoops, slip slides, is that you think about how you are personally connecting to art. Where are you using art and where are you, um, how are you connecting to art and what are you learning about through art? And I want you to really sit and think about that. And if you aren't, 
think about how you can add that into your life because one, I think everybody needs that. And two, if we are not ready to experience art like that for ourselves, how are we going to get our students to do that? So I really want you to think, you know, we don't challenge you to find those connections through art and, and make it happen for yourself. So all that said is then how do we then take this? How do we prime our students to have these life giving personal connections to works of art? Where, what do we do to create that happen, to make that happen? So like I said, I am doing a bunch of research on this and I've come up with a few different avenues that we can, we can try and that we can um, help or that will could potentially lead to this. And that is in four different environments in the student themselves, in the classroom environment, in your pedagogy, how you're doing your teaching and in the actual curriculum itself. So we're going to go through each of those really quickly and talk about, you know, how we can prime our students to have these powerful personal connections to works of art. So in my research that I've been doing, I've been reading some articles, interviewing people, still in progress, like I said, what the student needs to have, um, and I got this kind of based on, like I said, the interviews and things I've been doing, but the student should have more self-awareness be able to see themselves and see who they are, how they feel, what they want, um, really be connected with who they are. And I think that is the ultimate goal, like I said, of a person. Self-awareness is huge. Um, Emotional literacy. So we already talked about that too, being able to recognize and acknowledge the different feelings that they are experiencing and how to name them, Um, being able to recognize them to another people, how to name them. Um, visual literacy, so being able to look at and name things and observe things. So this is stuff we can we can work on in art. We can we can look at more artwork. The more they look at, the more they're going to develop those visual literacy skills. Curiosity is a really important thing. You know, the more you know, the more you want to know. And so being curious about the world will allow you to make those connections. You know, if you see something and you just want to know more, you want to think about it more, like that's a really important sort of skill, even I would say that the students would need and they need courage. You need to to have that bravery to step forward and be like, yes, I can. I can talk about these things. I can think about these things. I can allow myself to feel these things. So that's in the student, you know, it's not, there's not a whole lot we can do about a lot of the stuff, but there's things we can do. And then in the classroom, we need a passionate, enthusiastic, and connected teacher. Now, I'm not telling you to go, like, pretend to be enthusiastic when you're not actually. You need to be authentically you. (laughs) But you can be authentically you and passionate about what you're teaching, connected to the art, connected to the topic, enthusiastic about what you're teaching. And that will rub off on your students. If If you pick, like, a super boring work of art to teach about, that will... That will, that will, they'll, they'll know that you're not interested. They'll know that this isn't, you don't see this really as valuable, that you're just doing it because you have to. So find that passion, find that connection to your why, find that connection to your art and, and why you're doing this in the first place. Also in the classroom, we need a safe and connected space. We need students to know that all people are accepted. All ideas are accepted, that we can be wrong, we can take risks, we can make mistakes, all of that kind of stuff. Um, You want to model passion, joy, delight, and curiosity. When someone in your classroom says something about an artwork that is interesting, you are amazed by it, delighted by it, you know, you want to show them that what they have to say is valuable. What they have to say is important and interesting to you. And then we want uh, a classroom where it is okay, like our, I think I already said this one, is embracing uncertainty with the permission to be wrong. That there is, like I said, when interpreting art, there is a wrong. If you feel that, who's to say it's wrong? We can't, we can't do that. Okay. Then in our pedagogy and the way we teach, we need to do connection and conversation over lecture and information. Um, memorizing dates. Boring biographies of artists that are like, where they went to school, like, yes, knowledge is good and interesting, but we have to strike that balance of why are we teaching what we're teaching? 
is time better spent connecting and having conversations than just the giving of information. We need our pedagogy to be open-minded, open-ended, and then have engaging, connected activities. You know, you're writing, creative writing about artworks. You're moving your bodies. You're, you know, um, listening to music and connecting it to art. You're doing all of the things that are interesting and engaging with an artwork. And then lastly, your curriculum. You know, a lot of... I, I come to terms with this over the last few years is, you know, as a person who sells curriculum <laughs> to teachers, curriculum isn't everything. A good lesson plan is not everything. You need to have the other stuff. You need to have the passion, the enthusiasm, the connection, the relationships, um, the emotional um, availability, the vulnerability, all of those things. But also you need to have a curriculum that reflects all of that too. So it's, it's, there's a balance. Exposure to diverse art. So we don't want to just show, and it's funny, I put on this slide, there's like a really traditional like Renaissance painting. That's funny. I didn't, I was just putting pictures of people looking at art. Diversity of art from across time and across cultures. We need to expose our students to wide ranging facets of, of human creation of what humans are and what they've created and who they are. And then above and beyond that, not just showing diverse artwork an artist, but also representing the students that you are teaching. Students need to see themselves in the art. If they're more, if they're going to be more likely to make a connection to an artwork if they see themselves in it. Like imagine that Picasso, it was Picasso's boy before a mirror. Would I have had the same emotional power or connection to it if it was a, a boy? because I'm not a boy, you know, like think about that. Like you need to think about representing the students in your classroom. So if you have a classroom that is like 95% black students, most of the art you show should be black artists, should have black people in it. You know, like it should be connected to who they are. You, you do want diversity. You want to show it all, but you also need to show them, they need to see themselves in the artwork. That is so very important. So one of the interesting things that came out of um, my interviews that I've done is that a lot of people had more strong emotional connections to artworks that they knew about, that they knew about the artist, they knew about the painting, like something that they knew about. And this I didn't like this. I didn't want this on here, to, to be completely honest. But it was there. It's showing up. You know, again, this is not like super scientific research I'm doing right now. But I think that just like I said with curiosity, the more you know, the more you want to know, that is really the key here. So it's not necessarily like giving them knowledge for the sake of having knowledge, but that it is exposing them to the wider array of knowledge of what knowledge is and how you know, all the, this, these histories that then opens you up to be curious to know more and to be more ready to accept that emotional connection to it. So that's in there. Okay. Um, and in the curriculum, we want social emotional learning. Like I said, it's not all have to be rigor or academic um, learning things to put on tests like that. We can find those emotional, social and emotional connections. And it, some districts and states actually have social emotional standards now, which I think is really cool. And I'm, I'm looking forward to that becoming more widespread. And then visual literacy, which I had on another slide as well. So I was on there twice. <laughs> it was on the, the student one too, but I guess the curriculum should have that. And then, then that's taught to the student. It's in both. So anywho, you know, I hope it really sink in that art is power and art is magic. Art is emotion. Art is feeling. It's something somebody made, someone touched and created it so that someone else could look at it and enjoy it. A lot of art is made, you know, purely personal from the artist, but even then once it leaves them and becomes a piece of this world and a piece of the people who look at it and that connects us with other people. And that is so powerful. So I want you to think about this as you're, as you're planning your curriculum, as you're thinking about what you're going to do in your classroom, think about like, let's imagine one child, they go, they have three art teachers, elementary, middle, and high that are dedicated to looking at art, talking about it and showing art to their students. And imagine that every month 
as an elementary student, once a month, it's really, it's doable, right? Um, they look at one hour per month, kinder through fifth grade. Then that student goes on to high school or middle school. Say they only take um, two semesters of art in middle school. Some take less, some take more. But let's say they do two semesters. They do one hour per week. Since they're seeing them every day, it's doable. One hour per week. We love artwork of the week over at our class curator. Um, and then they go to high school, do one hour per week for one year. I don't know why I put two semesters in one year on there. It should just say one year both times. But anyway, say they do all of that. One hour per month, kinder through five. One hour per week for a year for middle. One hour per work per week for one year for high school. That student has looked at 120 artworks. They have done creative writing around it. They have done movement activities. They have done discussions. They've had the hard conversations. They've done personal reflections. They've done all of that with these 120 works of art. And then imagine that student going through their lives, having all of that in them. They're not going to remember every single one of those artworks, but they're going to go into their world having that and they're going to be like old friends in their head and they're going to see something at a museum that will connect them to something they learned. And that is going to prime them for a lifetime of connection to art. So really, I hope that you embrace this mission of showing more art to your students, showing more diverse art to your students, having more connected experiences with works of art where the student is doing the teach, the student is doing the connecting, the thinking, not do, not the teacher doing the telling. And that what a powerful experience that could be on this world because that famous quote from John Butler, art changes people and people change the world. I 100% wholeheartedly agree with that, that art can make a difference in this world. And you as an art teacher know that and we can continue this life-changing mission to expose our students to more works of art so they can have these, these moments that I've articulated here today. So thank you so much for making it through this presentation and for joining me on this mission. Please again, reach out to me if you want to share your art story with me because I would absolutely love to hear it. And wonderful. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Bye. All right. That is my episode for you today. Again, that was my presentation for call to art two, which was rediscovering the emotional power of art. If you're interested in checking out the recordings for call to art, again, you can head on over to artclasscurator.com slash CTA, and that will give you the ability to watch all of those amazing presentations. We have things on making sketchbooks, on diversity, on classroom management, on, you know, all sorts of topics, not just related to distance learning, but to the wide array of things that our teachers care about. So again, artclasscurator.com slash CTA. What's keeping you from showing more artwork to your students? Do you get stuck trying to choose a work of art or do you fear your students will ask a question that you don't know the answer to? Have you tried to start a classroom art discussion but didn't know what to say or how to get your students talking? Are you worried you're gonna spend a ton of time researching and planning a lesson that none of your students are interested in? That's why we created Beyond the Surface, a free professional development email series all about how to teach works of art through memorable activities and thoughtful classroom discussions. With Beyond the Surface, you'll discover how to choose artworks your students will connect with and learn exactly what to say and do to spark engagement and create a lasting impact. Plus, you'll get everything you need to curate these powerful learning experiences without spending all of your time planning. Sign up to receive this free professional development email course at artclasscurator.com slash surface. Thank you so much for listening to the Art Class Curator podcast. If you like what you hear, please subscribe and give us an honest rating on iTunes to help other teachers find us and hear these amazing art conversations and art teacher insights. Be sure to tune in next week for more art inspiration and curated conversations.